Hello there. Welcome to the Imperial Bureau shit. Hello there. Welcome to the Imperial Security Bureau podcast. We're named after Star Wars, like the CIA in Star Wars. I'm Blake Williams with Hyperdrive Recruiting. Today, we've got an awesome guest. His name is Shankar Viswanathan. Here he is, Shankar, head of cloud security at Credit Karma. I'm a big fan of this company. I actually am a customer of theirs. But he has a master's degree in information security, started out in systems engineering, network engineering. He's been a consultant for PwC, a senior security engineer for Intuit, and senior director of platform and infrastructure security, GRC enforcement at Visa for almost eight years. He's a Forbes Technology Council member and currently serving as director, head of cloud security at Credit Karma for almost three years. We're talking cloud security, non-human identity security, and a bunch of other cool stuff like applied crypto and how to deal with stress in the cybersecurity department and a bunch of other cool stories. This is his first podcast, and I'm so excited about that. He does a great job. I think you guys are going to love it. Let's go. Well, all right. Welcome to the podcast. Shankar, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. Doing well. The sun finally came out. Out here on the East Coast, it's been raining for about a week now so yeah it feels like uh the world's coming alive again we're not stuck inside <laughs> that's good that's good yeah yeah here out in california it's it's been uh it's been pretty hot this summer and uh the last few days have been good but uh, again i think it's gonna hit 90s or 95s again next week so we'll see uh, yeah i'm a weirdo i love it when it gets hot but um, i get very grumpy whenever it gets cold outside if it's, even if it dips down below 50 degrees I, I just, uh, I'm like, uh, nope, I don't want to go outside. <laughs> I'm weird. I love baking in the hot sun. I must be like a, a lizard or something. So uh, our background here, we just got connected. I've been following you on LinkedIn for a while. And, um, you know, you've got an incredible cybersecurity background, but I'm going to let you get into it, man. What What's your story and how'd you land in cybersecurity? So, uh, I mean, um, I would consider myself fortunate to have been in the cybersecurity industry from the mid-2000s when cybersecurity was not recognized. I don't know if it was even called cybersecurity. At that time, it was called the information security. And uh, that's where I started my career, right? Like I, I did my master's in information security and then started to work in the information security field. And at that time, it was not a security role. It was mostly associated with IT and uh, started off working with the IT team, setting up directory services, the good old Active Directory, LDAPs, and uh, provisioning passwords, accounts. And uh, then then slowly, as the industry started taking shape, in a way, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's paradoxical, right? Like, I would like to thank the hackers and attackers, right? Like, who brought in the necessary attention to this field, uh, and it started growing. Uh, because uh, the defense mechanisms need to increase. And I was fortunate to be right in the crux of it. And uh, I grew with the industry. Nice. Yeah, I guess I, I've never heard it put that way. Thanks to the hackers. They give me job security. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like the yin and the yang. Of the, it's the, we have to maintain balance. <laughs> but yeah, I noticed you were on, on your LinkedIn. I saw you were a Forbes Technology Council member. W what is that? And how are you involved in it? So this is uh, this is basically a forum. So one of the uh, founders that I know of in uh, from from Tel Aviv in, introduced me to that. So uh, this was again like a consortium where you you get to share your knowledge and talk with your peers. Uh, in this case, other technology professionals, security leaders, CIOs, and stuff like that. So we go in there. We have like periodic calls. We discuss about some of the trends and share knowledge. And sometimes. Forbes takes uh, some of these inputs that we have provided and publishes them as articles in their website. So yeah, it's just a forum. It's one of the other forums to get connected. So that's what that's how I would put it. Very cool. Yeah, I have to follow that. And um, 
you know, you've also got a really strong background and work history in the fintech industry, doing fintech security. And you mentioned something in your profile called applied crypto. I've never heard of that before. Can you explain that? Like you're trying to describe it to your your grandmother? <laughs> so, I mean, um, applied crypto, right? You know, you know the cryptocurrencies, right? Like prior to that, it was just called crypto. But uh, when I started putting, mentioning that crypto, people immediately started misconstruing it as like uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain and stuff like that. So applied crypto, to put it in simple terms, is uh, old school cryptography. And what is old school cryptography is like encryption, making sure your data that matters, your personally identifiable information is something that is not available in clear text that people could easily read it. So you're able to encrypt the data and sometimes you use a technique called the hashing, right? Like which is a one-way technique. So every every industry, every company needs it. So applied crypto is basically a combination of like how do you manage your your entire encryption stack? How do you manage your certificates, right? Like the whenever you access a, any any sort of site, there is a certificate that is involved. So uh, which is which is signed by a third party signatory. So maintaining all of that falls under the uh, old school cryptography, uh, aka applied cryptography that every company has. Aha. Uh-huh. So it's more about encryption than uh, cryptocurrencies or you know, digital no, currencies. Exactly. <laughs> you, okay. I'm assuming you thought the same way too, right? Like uh, that's that's precisely why I didn't want to call it crypto because people immediately think, okay, crypto is cryptocurrency, but it is not. Okay. All right. Well, learn something. And we're going to see what else we can learn from you today. What's happening in cyber right now? What's got everybody's attention? Always the problems that's been lingering from age old, which people are still trying to team it and uh, make it manageable, which is around uh, vulnerabilities. Right? How do you keep up with vulnerabilities? There's always new vulnerabilities show up. So you cannot scale your team to meet uh, the amount of work that it generates. So vulnerability management, uh, making sure how we are keeping the environment secure and sanitized is always an in thing that people hustle to make sure they are on top of it. That continues. Again, there is a whole lot that's happening in Gen AI. And to be frank, right? So I want to steer clear of that, right? Uh, not because yeah. I don't believe in Gen AI, but just that there's just so many things that's happening on Gen AI. The dust has to settle down in the next, uh, I would say, 12 months to 24 months, it would get clear. So what are the real use cases in security where AI or generative AI could help in? And there are always... I mean, there are two aspects, right? You Leveraging AI for security is one stream of work that's happening. And that is security for the AI. So I would, in my perspective, security for AI, it's of first importance, right? Like we want to make sure as companies adopt different AI models and start sending different prompts, we want to make sure the data is protected because as we all know, right? Like a Gen AI system is only as good as the data that goes into it. So we want to make sure as we send good data, the right people are having access to it and also not privileged information is not being sent to Gen AI. That's a part that the industry is focusing on. And the security for AI, sorry, AI for security, which is what I want to wait for it for the dust to settle down and see where where it is, because there's a lot of basics that we still need to uh, get in order before we get to the next advanced things. Agreed. Yeah, still a lot of unknown unknowns out there. But uh, I am seeing a lot of chatter online lately about something called non-human identities. And I've been researching about this. I guess there's human identities and then non-human identities, there's 45 times more non-human identities trying to access software than humans. And that sounds absurd, but can you explain this to us? Sure, yeah. I mean, um, definitely non-human identity has been in the recent uh, news, right? Like there's a lot of chatter happening around that. And again, non-human identities are not a new phenomenon, along with 
the vulnerabilities that I mentioned, non-human identities have always existed since the IT ecosystem existed. Uh, but there is a lot of traction on that. So again, getting to what is non-human identity, right? So as the name implies, we have the employees, contractors who work for the organizations who are humans and uh, access this provision when they join and they when they join an organization. And as they uh, continue to sustain in that organization, different accesses are requested, different authorizations are provided to them to enable them to access different systems. But behind the scenes in the IT ecosystem, be it like a data center based ecosystem or like cloud based ecosystem, there are these whole lot of services, microservices that talk to each other. They connect to different databases. Uh, they authenticate to different cloud native offerings like a Kafka-like service or a, or a BI intelligent service. So all these will require some sort of authentication between these services and service accounts or application accounts, which are created, which could be like, and, and service A could be using an account called service A123, right? So this service account has to access these different offerings within uh, within the cloud environment. So people can really impersonate as these service accounts or exploit the privileges of this service accounts and be able to gain access to what this service account has access to. So in a, in a more relatable example, I would say you might have come across uh, this incident where an NSA contractor, Edward Snowden, leaked sensitive data from the NSA's uh, systems. So this goes back to 2013, 14, if my memory serves right. So precisely Edward Snowden leveraged service accounts or keys that were unmanaged in the infrastructure. And uh, Edward Snowden impersonated as the service account and was able to traverse the network because the key or the service account that he leveraged had lot of privileges across the NSA's IT systems. So he was able to navigate and access different data that Edward Snowden as a human was not authorized to access. But a human leveraged a non-human identity, which is a key, and was able to traverse the network. So this is an old problem, but with cloud, these service accounts are getting created at a much rapid pace. When I say this could be service, service accounts, application account, mission identities, keys, all these are largely categorized as non-human identities, which are being created at a much faster pace. And uh, companies technically don't have insight into what are these service accounts? How are they created? What is the lifetime of this? What type of formations that they have? So that's where a lot of uh, these uh, cybersecurity companies are trying to come in and help out being able to detect them and try to help organizations manage uh, these uh, non-human identities. That's got to be tough. So human identities have two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication. Are there any equivalent solutions for non-human identities? No, I mean, multi-factor authentication, right? Or a, or a, or a second-factor authentication is largely for human so that a certain input can be provided. That is also an added problem to these uh, service accounts because the, these non-human identities are used by multiple services at scale, making tens of thousands of authentications. So you cannot add a friction there of any sort, right? That will slow down your system processing. So definitely 2FA, MFA is not possible. There are techniques like key-based authentication or uh, uh, mutual TLS authentication using certificates, which some of the uh, organizations employ. How long will a certificate last? Is it only available for you know a couple of minutes and then it basically gets deleted and it has to refresh, or do you get a new one every time? How, how does it work? Depends on how you configure it. So you can you can have certificates, uh, certain types of certificate that last for a year, three years, and uh, that could be. Uh, ephemeral certificates that last for just for that session. So the certificates are created when you authenticate. And uh, once you complete the activity that you need to complete, the certificates are destroyed. So so it all depends on how you want to employ it. There are different use cases for each of them. Recently, I heard a news that these 
third party public certificate signatory authorities like you have the very science dg certs they are now strictly enforcing a shorter time period right like i'm not sure if it is two or three years so previously there was up to 10 years but now they are restricting how long these public certificates can last so forcing the companies to rotate these certificates on a periodic basis. Having visibility into the type of non-human identities that you have is one part of the problem that companies would like to know about it. The second part of the problem is now that you know about it, can you go remediate it? So it is not as easy as like, let's say Blake is an employee and Blake has excessive access, say you're you're part of IT team, you're able to access some finance or some other data that you shouldn't be. It's pretty straightforward, right? Like, okay, Blake shouldn't be access, having access so we can remove it. Non-human identities, it's much harder because the downstream impact, if you go remove an access, you could cause a disruption to the service. It could cause a business impact. So you will be in front of the executive and the board to explain what you did and uh, why you did something that caused a revenue impact for the organization. And I'm sure it'll be so hard to justify that, hey, I was proactive in cleaning up non-human identities. Well, your proactiveness cost us X million dollars. <laughs> so who's going to pay for it? So again, the, the part that I'm trying to say is sometimes companies simplify to cater to their narrative to say that, hey, let's detect these stuff, right? And help you remediate, keep it clean. Well, it's always a risk management game, right? Looking at what you have, what are the different controls you have, and uh, what is the exploitability of a certain risk, and uh, what are the impacts of basically mitigating it, what happens if you leave it this, that way. So it's not an easy solution that you can scan these non-human identities and then remediate them, keep it clean 100% all the time. It doesn't work that way. So this is an example of, I would say, the problem is real, but it is oversimplified. That's where you need to watch out. And the simple thing to navigate that is making sure you have your basics straight, right? In, in this case, if I take non-human identity as an example, make sure you have the primitive infrastructure controls in place and operational, and you have a good handle of your human identities, how they are working and everything. So the reason why human identities, in my opinion, is important is that gives you a learning and exposure to go through the entire cycle of like identity and access management. So if you are not good at human identity management, which is relatively easier, doing non-human identity is going to go uh, over your head, right? Like, so it's, it's, it's going to be very hard. You need to understand what is your current posture, where you're at, Make sure that is at a reasonable level of maturity then before you start getting into other things. And what are the complete eight yards or nine yards for, for you to, uh, as you bring in this product, do you have a good asset management inventory where you can look up what systems have, what type of data, what type of uh, services hosted on it. So if you don't have all of those, finding it is great, then you will not be able to do anything else. That's where your game stops. I can see that problem compounding, and I know we're not going to dive into AI too much, but eventually people will have AI agents that do things on their behalf. Each one of those will be non-human identities that need access. So yeah, that's got to be a mind-boggling challenge. I mean, we're having a hard enough time trying to prevent humans from hacking. Now we deal with 45 times more non-humans, and that number is growing rapidly. So Godspeed to you, man. You got your work cut out for you. <laughs> Let us know when you get it figured out. <laughs> yeah, we have, we, have, we have worked on it extensively in the past. But again, the, the problems that I'm calling out in terms of how do you team it are basically real problems that even exist today, right? So if I have to give you a specific example that in my experience that we were not able to solve because this was something that we were trying to detect the transitive access in an environment, it could be cloud or a network, which means a system A can access system B, system B can access system C, right? Like, and let's say there are non-human identities in each of them. So you can start at system A, then go to system B, then go to system C, D. So how do you stop this, right? You cannot say, let's remove the accesses between these systems, right? So that's the easiest way to do it. But guess what? There is a business reason 
for system A to talk to system B. There is a business reason for system B to talk to system C and a reason for C to talk to D. So if you break the chain, well, something in your business process is going to break, right? So that's where I say it is, it's great to know this network traversal path, but how are you going to remediate this, right? So it gets harder and challenging. And uh, sometimes you just know about it. You may be recorded as a risk registry that making sure that anyone who gets to access to system A and whoever is approving that access should be aware that the account or the human could possibly have access to these 10 or 12 different downstream systems, right? So at least bringing in that context would help people who are providing access to system A, which is the entry point, to make sure that, hey, I pay more closer attention. I don't frivolously give access to anyone who is coming to this thing. And uh, sometimes AI helps here when, 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 when we start adopting it, where it could give me that context if I'm trying to approve or provision an access. This access means you, you are looking at it as like approving access to B, but guess what? B has access to C, C has access to D. So you're actually giving access to B, C, D, E, F, etc. So that's where the context helps. But at the end of the day, if the access is still required, you might have to create it. So again, it's a hard problem to solve. We'll see how the industry evolves and uh, the technology with it. It's a very fine line that you have to ride there. You know, one small update could have a you know, millions of dollars in loss of revenue. So no wonder why systems have to be so locked down and hidden under a pile of bureaucracy. And I said, you know, I hear about a lot of engineers kind of talking about that, especially early in career. They have, you know, they want to get into cybersecurity. They love hacking. They get, the, they get these jobs and it doesn't take very long for kind of like the wind to get sucked out of their sails and their bubble burst because there is a lot of bureaucracy there and there's very little impact that they can have you kind of have to stay in your lane so you don't break anything nothing impacts revenue and for good reason right but that brings me to an, another point i wanted to cover with you because we were going to chat about cybersecurity leadership in your opinion your head of cloud security i don't know how big your team is maybe we can talk about that a little bit but aside from that what in your opinion keeps cybersecurity talent engaged and happy in their job it all it all depends on the different experience level different levels so sometimes if you have Entry level engineers, they are very aspirational to like learn new things, get fully accustomed into the cybersecurity space. So, so getting them that exposure and uh, aiding them so that they can work with someone more experienced. So, at that point, people are more curious about uh, learning, taking a step back, right? So, in cybersecurity, there's a lot of tools and there's a lot of trainings out there, unlike software engineering, right? So, if you take traditional software engineering, programming, in any of the languages, you could learn the language and then you could uh, practice at different levels, build your websites, build everything uh, at home, at leisure, and get to a reasonable level of skill set and uh, before you make yourself available in the professional market. But cybersecurity as a space, you could learn the basics and the theoretical concepts, but to actually learn something, you need to work right? If we take, say, bot mitigation, it takes a whole lot of effort, right? You should be a well-funded hacker or attacker in order for you to create the bot or a botnet and mimic attacking your fake website and thereby learn cybersecurity and bot mitigation. There are smart people out there who could do that, but I'm just telling for the general population, it is super hard. So that's where the barrier to entry to cybersecurity it's pretty high because you need to stumble on it. And then once you get that opportunity, you need to start learning it. Because otherwise, say vulnerability management, you cannot create a cluster of thousand servers and then drop in vulnerabilities there, scan them so that you know and learn vulnerability management. No, you've got to have a job in a company organization that runs at scale. Then you should be fortunate to be put in the vulnerability management space so you can actually use the tools and learn it. Otherwise, it'll just be theoretical concepts that will be hard to back it with the, the practical experience. So with that context, I would say like going back to what keeps the engineers happy, the 
relatively the newer engineers that I've seen is like they want to learn because they've got this opportunity either through the interview process or like they had some sort of cybersecurity theoretical education. Through that, they get in and they wanted to learn as much as possible from the experienced folks. And uh, the mid to experienced folks, again, they, they look at challenging problems because they would know the basics and fundamentals. And as you go up the ladder, so I think people look for, because cybersecurity requires not just doing the technical work, you should be able to collaborate with the different teams, work with the legal team, privacy team, and uh, auditors. So this all gives you different levels of exposure. So as you grow up the ladder, one would expect that they are involved in these different aspects. So that would prepare them for this wholesome cybersecurity expert who knows the technical stuff, who are able to talk to the different folks, right? Like uh, the lawyers, the privacy folks, the, the HR team, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, that's at the ground level, like what keeps the engineers happy, right? Not just technology, but this wholesome. Yeah, there's a lot to learn to be really uh, strong in cybersecurity. And there's a lot of entry level folks that are trying to get in. They're trying to learn. Right. And you got to start small. But I think what they don't realize and, and why it's so hard to break in as a rookie is because, you know, you need a foundation in infrastructure servers. You need to know networking like you need to have worked in these areas. And then at that point, once you've mastered that, Okay, now I see the broad picture. Now I may have some input here in cybersecurity. It's hard to just get a cybersecurity job as a straight rookie. And that's from what I'm seeing in the job market. Companies, they don't really have any needs for entry level, especially in cybersecurity. You're just going to kind of hold the team back. You're going to be dead weight, a lot of training required. They only want to hire people who have a lot of experience that can hit the ground running in the job on day one. Is that what you're seeing? In my perspective, right? So when I hire junior folks who don't have a security experience, I look for computer science background, not necessarily cybersecurity, because there are maybe these days there are more folks with some cybersecurity certification or something of that sort. But largely, computer science background should be good. And uh, they should have at least an understanding of the field, because cybersecurity is not software engineering. So you cannot come here and just build a random web application, right? And or build a mobile app. So I think you should know what you're getting into with the right computer science background, then you can possibly come in. So going back to your point around, hey, are they a dead weight? It depends on the size of the company, right? So if you're a startup or like just as getting off of a startup, right? Like maybe a, a 500 people company and you have a 10 member security team, Every 10 people in that team must know cybersecurity. But if you're like, I mean, I've worked for big fintechs in the past, right? Like we had like huge teams over there. So there it's it's good. I mean, especially I would say if folks are looking to break into cybersecurity, look for a matured company, right? Where you have a better chance because there they could afford to hire someone. I mean, I've done this in the past, right? Like hired folks without cybersecurity experience with computer science and an interest for them to pursue a career in cybersecurity, which we will get to know in the interview process. Again, it's not rocket science, right? Uh, because I'm part of this field. I don't want to make it too complicated, but it's not rocket science. Just that you need to sit with it and learn just like any other area. So if they spend a couple of years, they will be able to figure out head and tail of it and uh, build a specialization on a specific area. So go, go reasonably deeper, build your specialization, like let's say vulnerability management, you start building or applied crypto, you start building a skill. Then if you want to stick to that field, by all means, right, within cybersecurity, or you can broaden it and get into other areas by staying with the same team, thereby expanding knowledge. So uh, that's what I would say. Very cool. What tools would you learn first? Like what are some of your favorite foundational cybersecurity tools? I would say learning. IAM, identity management. The reason I say IAM, coincidentally, I entered through IAM. So that's not the, I'm not again stating because of that. The reason is the benefit that I got having entered through IAM, like managing directory services, accounts, passwords is you get a purview of the complete IT ecosystem. What are the different systems out there? What are people trying to get access to? So it gets you accustomed to your organization's IT footprint. And you will be working on giving people or non-human identities access, right? 
and helps you understand the ecosystems. From, from there, you can build on. And, and another area similar to this that gives you an overview of the different space is like vulnerability management space, where you enter that space, you are able to scan all the networks, you get a bird's eye view of what your uh, organization operates, and uh, that gives you a good foothold into what your organization's problems are, then you can get into the different different areas that you can solve for. Where do you like to go for your news and your threat intel? Threat intel, formally, there are organizations from fintech, I could say there is an organization called FSISAC, FSISAC. So that provides a lot of threat intel. It's a, it's a group of all security fintech professionals. We come together, we share uh, intel. Different organizations' happenings are shared so the other organizations are uh, alerted on. In terms of how do you keep yourself up to date in in security? I mean, like your podcasts, there are a lot of educational podcasts that's out there. I do I do listen to some of them time and again. And LinkedIn is, is a good source, right? As trivial as it sounds, right? Like, But there are a lot of good content that is posted out there. I follow a few people uh, who, who do post a lot of good content. So that keeps me abreast. and. There are security news articles like Bleeping Computer, Hacker Zone, etc. So, which which kind of provide some insights. Yeah. Bleeping Computer. Everyone says Bleeping Computer. Yeah. And Krebs. Krebs is. Uh, but you can Krebs find him on security. LinkedIn. Yeah. 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 Krebs on security. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good source. Yeah. And I, I know I know you had uh, Daniel Messler. He has a lot of great content that he publishes. I'm in no way to claim that I read all of his articles, but. I have read few of few of his, so no doubt. Yeah, I highly recommend his newsletter and his YouTube channel. It's called Unsupervised Learning. He's on the forefront of uh, cyber and AI, so uh, check him out. It's it's also there on Spotify. So Spotify has a lot of great content, and uh, your peer. There are also a few folks who create cybersecurity, cloud security podcasts. Uh, is this your first podcast, Shankar? Yes, this is my first first podcast. Yes. All right, hey. Welcome, Imperial Security Bureau, sir. Hey, are you a Star Wars fan at all? Uh, no. No? Okay. No. Yeah. Well, may the force be with you anyway. <laughs> Just to get to know you a little bit, what's your favorite movie? So I like a lot of good movies come up, but uh, if I have to say, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you the genre of movies that I typically watch, and I'll give you okay. some specific movies that I really like. So I like watching war and strategy movies. Um, oh. And I also watch horror, and I'm, I'm scared of watching horror movies, but I do I do end up watching time and again some, some nice horror movies. So these are the genres I, I usually watch, and uh, movies specifically, like I like the classic uh, Shining, I like it very much, uh, and uh, for, for uh, the war and strategy movie, Bridge of Spies. Bridge of Spies. Who's in that? Yeah, Tom, Tom Hanks. Hanks. Yeah, Tom Hanks. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I have seen that. Now, as far as like the war movies go, what's the most recent thing that came out? Did you see a Napoleon? No, I did not see Napoleon. I saw a 1917 a recent oh, movie. Yeah, that's a good one. Hey, I want to chat with you a little bit about recruiting and hiring and, and stuff like that. I guess, uh, when's the last time you hired someone? I hired someone. Um, I've extended an offer a week ago and I had someone onboarded a month ago. Very cool. Glad to hear you guys are growing over there. I love the company that you're at, Credit Karma. I've got their app. I log in probably once every two weeks to see what's going on, look at my credit score and all that. Um, but uh, it, it's it's a very helpful app, And w but we're not going to talk about that too much. So I'll open it up here to you know ask me anything as a recruiter. Do you have any questions for a recruiter? Uh, I would say like, uh, I mean, um, how do you funnel the candidates, right? What are the means that you employ to funnel candidates? Uh, yeah, it's a mix. There's a ton of tools out there for sourcing. And then you put up a lot of ads. So you get inbound applicants, social media, content, you know, sharing content. People come to you looking for opportunities. You can try to connect them to roles. It doesn't always match up with a role that you have right this second, but could be, you know, three months later, six months later, hey, I have the perfect role. So, you know, passive candidates like that. And then straight up headhunting, you know, on LinkedIn, trying to pull people from companies, competitors. Those are the most valuable, you know, candidates if you can snag somebody from their competitor. And uh, most of those 
most of the time, those people are very happily employed. So you have to approach them with the right message just to get them to chat with you. And yeah, but it's kind of a mixture of everything, really. I've placed people that I've met on a Friday night at a restaurant. I placed my favorite bartender one time back when I used to, you know, drink a lot. <laughs> I limit it to one, maybe two now. But yeah, I mean, candidates can come from everywhere and referrals. People are referred to me all the time. Yeah. Kind of a nice benefit of being in the business for a long time. Having a solid network and hot sheets. I've got Excel spreadsheets that I've been keeping for 10 years and they're categorized per skill set. So not everybody has that. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, come from everywhere, man. What other questions you have? Yeah, I think I mean, um, definitely because, because you're doing above and beyond these podcasts, uh, that, that helps you build your network and, uh, make your presence felt right. Which is one way that, uh, because I've seen typically rep- recruiters, third-party recruiters, right? Like having relationships with the organizations or the hiring leaders, whichever company that they are in. So that way, when they have a position, they know who to call. Right, right. Do you already have a favorite recruiter that you call when you have an opening? Yeah, I have a couple of them, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I was just curious because a lot of companies now, they have it locked up where, you know, you have to use internal. They're not spending money with agencies and uh, it's I mean, mostly uh, for kind of challenging. Leadership, leadership recruiting, we try to reach out, but uh, engineers, we try to source because there is a lot of good talent out there with the current unfortunate economic situation and the layoffs and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of lot of people, at least for the IC recs that I've opened in the past three to four months, um, I've never had any dearth of candidates applying, but whether they match the skill set or not, that's different. But uh, I think there was always a pipeline of candidates always applying. It was hard for us to catch up. So, but for leadership, the leadership role, you got to be careful because you need to preserve the team's culture, your organization's values. So it's always worked well if you go through a reference, either someone you've worked with or somebody whom you trust is able to provide a strong reference that you can bring on. Yeah, agreed. You know, right now, the way the market is, companies are so hesitant to spend money, you know, for placement fees. You know, I'm also doing career coaching and resume reviews, LinkedIn profile reviews. That's been something that I've started here recently. And um, I really enjoyed that. You know, I've done it for free for over 10 years. And, you know, I was thinking about like formalizing it. I really thought I could turn it into a full-blown service. Only because there's a lot of services out there where people that really have no business providing resume, writing services, they've never even been in a position to hire, never done any recruiting. They're calling themselves like a, a career coach and a, a resume writer. I'm like, you, when's the last time you screened through 500 resumes? Do you know exactly how that happens? So uh, I find it strange. There seems to be a lot of imposters out there. So I feel like the market is uh, very hungry for authentic and real information. Now, somebody like you with the presence that you have and the reputation that you've built in the fintech industry, you know, you probably don't even need a resume. It's less important whenever you have a presence and you're a known expert in the field, but not everybody has that luxury. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, I I always, uh, I always wonder, are resumes still relevant, especially with LinkedIn is the primary mode. Like everybody asks for what's your LinkedIn profile. And yeah, definitely you need to keep your LinkedIn. I mean, I would say if if it's either or, you should have your LinkedIn profile up to date and uh, current. Yeah. I, I used to I used to wonder like how, how relevant are the resumes. But uh, yeah, I mean, maybe sometimes for the junior recs. So it is it is still still important. But speaking of AI, I feel like the resume writing is a prime thing that an AI tool would target to basically skim through your LinkedIn profile and you can tell the AI system that they create a two-pager. So it should be able to create, uh, once you feed your LinkedIn profile, it should be able to scan your public profile and create a resume, right? So out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, and that's true, right? You can get it to Wordsmith and it sounds a little better, right? You can give, you can prompt it. There are some use cases for that, but I have to spend a lot of time with people actually pulling the information out of them that they should have put on their resume already, right? That's the biggest thing that's missing. These are are highly relevant keywords that should be in your profile that recruiters are searching in their little Boolean searches 
all day long, you're never going to show up for these jobs. So an AI, it may sound nice, but an AI is not going to be able to pull information out of your brain. It's only going to take the resume that you feed it and reword it and make it sound a little bit nicer, right? But I, I agree about the LinkedIn thing. Super important. You know, people lose the file to their resume all the time. You land the job, you get a new computer. Oh, where'd my resume go? It's five years ago. And now I don't have it. Oh man, I need to write one from scratch. Why didn't you just keep your LinkedIn profile updated? <laughs> In LinkedIn, they used to have a feature, a resume builder feature. My mind is boggled why they got rid of that. It's no longer totally. available. Yeah, you can download your resume as a PDF, but the resume builder feature is gone and you used to be able to like a little customize it before you applied. And uh, I don't understand why that disappeared. Let's see here. We got a couple more minutes left and I want to chat with you, just, uh, you know, personal stuff. Are there any habits or routines that you feel like personally have helped lead to your success? One thing that I would say is like any any opportunity that you get, right? Like especially in a professional environment, giving your giving your hundred percent, right? So this is this might sound cliched, but uh, getting an opportunity is just a door to multiple other opportunities. So when you are given something and a project or an initiative, properly plan plan for it. Planning is very critical be able to execute on it and don't exit the initiative until you fully complete it, right? Like this is something that my mentors have taught me. And uh, when you talk to any of my team members, I am I emphasize this all the time. Why this is important is like when you plan thoroughly, you are able to think through the problem. It gives you a sense of ownership, right? Like when you're not planned, you're always caught off guard. And the, the reaction that employees give is like, basically try to shy away from accountability or ownership, right? Because you're caught off guard. So you don't want, you want to stay away from it. And the other part outside of planning is like uh, completing it end to end, right? It's always when you're working on something that is, there are different phases of it, right? So you are excited, you get started, people, everyone around you is excited, then, then people forget about it, but you still need to run with it. And, uh, then there are low points where something doesn't work. People question you like, why are we even doing this? It should have not been done this way. If you really believe in it, you have a plan, you pursue it, you make people understand because you know what you're doing. And then you complete it. That feeling when you complete this end to end, it teaches you a lot of things that could be templated and put to use in different projects, even in your personal life, any personal activities that you're planning to do, it could it could help you. Hey, I wanna I wanna climb Mount Everest. Okay, what is the plan? When are you planning to do? It's it's so important. So that's what I would say. Having that discipline and be able to plan and stick to it until you complete. Right, like do this for at least in your initial part of the career. It's very important that you start something, you plan, and you finish it. That's, uh, in my opinion, very, very important. Great advice. Yeah, my parents always taught me if you're going to do something, do it right the first time. And um, so I've always tried to keep that mentality. And it, it sounds like your parents probably had the same uh, guidance for you. And you know, if you're going to, if you're given work, I mean, you want to deliver something that you can be very proud of because you're right. Even if you feel like, oh man, I got to sign the crappiest project in the whole company. And this is terrible, right? You can feel like it's beneath you, right? This is not even worth my time. If you can fight those feelings the best you can and see it as an opportunity where, hey, you know what? It's a dirt sandwich right here that I have to complete this, but I'm going to make this incredible. I'm going to yeah. turn this into the best project I have ever done. If you approach all the challenges that way, then you'll quickly build trust with your peers and bosses and get promotions and all kinds of incredible things can happen for you. Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, I mean, in, in all of our career, right, if you just look back, I think the things that would have stood out are the things that you have been with it end to end, gone through those ups and downs that I just mentioned. In my case, say for now, I cannot be end to end on all the initiatives, right? So sometimes I'm in and out of some of them because my time is required at different places. But I'm able to do that effectively because I've been on few of them end to end, gone through the ups and downs. And that has taught me a whole lot of things that I could 
extract and use it in bits and pieces on different areas. So that's what people fail to understand, especially when somebody has gotten that opportunity to be on this one uh, big initiative and go through that end to end, go through with the emotions, endure it, and uh, you will thank yourself for going through that for the rest of your life. Yeah, I've got a story. This was after I'd left the insurance industry and I was in debt and I was trying to figure out a way to kind of like hit the escape button on my life and do something completely different. So I went to be a waiter on a cruise ship for Norwegian Cruise Lines and it was in Hawaii. I had a great time, but they start you out with these really low level jobs, rolling silverware into napkins. It was like a couple of weeks in. And they assigned me to this role. It was called the mucker. It was basically like dishwashing. People would roll all the dirty dishes from the buffet. And you're not actually the dishwasher, but you're the person that has to organize all the dirty dishes, dump all the food into the trash, stack all the plates that are similar, the coffee cups. Everything needs to be nice and neat so that the dishwasher can be very fast at like organizing all the dishes that run through the machine. Right. And you need a full apron to do this job. Otherwise your, all your clothes get ruined, dirty food everywhere. And I thought that job was so beneath me. I couldn't even believe that I was being asked to do that. I was like, I didn't come on this shit to do this. Like I would imagine myself, you know, in fancy restaurants and in, in beautiful Hawaii, I didn't think I was going to be doing this. I was kind of reluctantly in there going slow and like thinking the whole time I was like, this is bullshit. Well, the manager of the restaurant, he came in there and he embarrassed me in front of everybody. Hey, you're going too slow, son. Who do you think you are? And I mean, he made me feel this tall and what he did, he's like, let me show you how to just step, step aside. And he's in this nice officer uniform, right? It's white. And he looks like the captain of the ship. And he steps in and he starts mucking as fast as I've ever seen it done before. Stacking plates. And he was like lightning fast, like he had been doing it a thousand years. And he didn't get a speck of anything on him. Like he stayed completely clean. None of his uniform got touched by even a little bit of spaghetti sauce. He's like, this is how you do it, son. I don't want to hear you complaining. And he kept putting me on because he knew I hated it. He kept putting me on as the mucker. Eventually, I just decided that, all right, I'm actually going to become good at this. I got to learn how to get faster. And what I found out was I enjoyed it and I became good at it. It actually became the best job in the buffet because everybody comes to visit you. They're rolling all these rolling tables full of all the dirty dishes and they got to come visit you like 50 times a shift. And it's an opportunity for you to make friends and crack jokes and, you know, uh, just be happy. Right. So I ended up loving that job. I wanted to be put on the mucking crew and I was like super fast at it. I was friends with the dishwashers, friends with the managers. It completely changed my whole attitude. So if you can take that approach, And even the jobs that you don't want to do like that, being a mucker on the cruise ship taught me so much. (laughs) It's a great journey. When you look back, definitely you're going to appreciate the time that you spent, what you learned there. This might have taught you like patience and then. uh... Put your ego aside, you know, (laughs) put your ego aside. So a couple more questions here and then I'm going to let you go. In a cyber role, the pressure is very high. What have you found to really help you alleviate stress in the role? Yeah, uh, I agree. There is a lot of stress, especially um, when there are cybersecurity incidents, right? So you are technically, you might have a capable team to respond to, right? But the aftermath just goes on and on, right? Like hearing after hearing, and you got to go uh, meet different people, explain your explain what happened. So that is more stressful to me rather than the actual incident or incident response, which I'm sure many people have gone through and are going through, right? So I think that part is unavoidable. And uh, as long as, as, you, as you just mentioned about your story, right? Like when you embrace it and when you accept it, there becomes a peace within you, right? Like, and you start to accept that as a part of your responsibility and not as why are they 
asking this? Why I, why do I need to explain myself? I've put in so much work. So that's what usually comes to your mind. But when you accept that as a part of your job, people do question. And uh, the aftermath is something that you need to go through. How gracefully you handle it is part of your responsibility. And as you grow higher in rank, so as you go higher in rank in the cybersecurity hierarchy, so uh, this is uh, more expected. So yeah, definitely acceptance uh, as a part of it. And the second thing is if you are able to plan and uh, be able to understand your ecosystem and uh, not go behind every pigeon that flies by you, right? So it's going to uh, make you go crazy. So be able to like plan, prioritize, and look at things that really could get you into an incident, right? And start addressing that. Uh, and there are always good to have, nice to have things. So so that's why I say like, you need to be ruthless when you're going through the list of things and uh, address only things that doesn't have defense in depth. There are no other compensating controls. It is an easy exploit, right? Otherwise, like you can do more things, but look at these, prioritize, start addressing those. Uh, and uh, that would delay an incident happening possibly prevent if you're really good at doing everything right and that kind of helps you manage the stress right good advice i agree well uh well shankar this has been great man you've been an awesome guest how can people find you i'm on linkedin i'm reasonably active i know there are a lot of people who are very active you know i always get conscious like just posting different things i i i try to critically question, right? Like, is this of anything of value add, right? So, <laughs> but otherwise I'm reasonably active on LinkedIn and uh, feel free to hit me up there. I, I look at messages pretty frequently, right? Like uh, almost every day. So, and uh, if there are specific things that I could be of help, then we can get connected from there. Very cool. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast, Shankar. And even though you're not a Star Wars fan, May the force be with you, sir. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Blake. Thanks for having me over. So uh, I really enjoyed talking uh, with you. Thanks a lot. Very welcome. It was fun. Take care, man. Cheers. See you.